And just like that, welcome everyone to the Real Leaders Podcast, where leaders keep it real. In today's episode, we'll be featuring Jim and Jackie Iverson, the co-founders of Sin Jam Pharmaceuticals. Uh, but first, uh, a little information about our Real Leaders Impact Collaborative. Of course, folks, this live stream that's also on LinkedIn and here on Crowdcast is brought to you by our Impact Collaborative memberships, which are our peer groups with a platform. Uh, when COVID hit, we decided to pivot as an organization to go to a membership-based model and bring together long-term thinkers to eliminate short-term thinking. Uh, so that's why we're doing that. And we believe in 2050, a lot of our members are going to be those driving innovation and advancements to achieve some of the, uh, the world's most existential problems. And today, uh, we have two people that are doing just that. That's Jim and Jackie Iverson, the co-founders of Senjam Pharmaceutical. Uh, Jim, Jackie, welcome to the show. Thank, Thank you, Kevin. Thank you, Kevin. Of course. Now, Jim and Jackie are no newcomers to the show. We've had them on a few different times. They're some of my favorite people to talk to. And Jim uh, has prior experience. So full disclosure, Jim is also a personal mentor of mine as well. So I wanted to have him on the show uh, for, from a leadership perspective. Uh, perspective as well. Um, but, you know, through our conversations, I've learned a lot about this disease. And I first think it's very important that we establish our prior relationship to make sure we're not trying to sell anyone on, on what this uh, topic is about. We're not trying to persuade everyone on what how we perceive this virus, because it is a very vulnerable subject. But I think in today's conversation, we can have an objective conversation around how Sem Jam Pharmaceutical uh, is approaching this virus and what your experience has been uh, through creating uh, a, a, a cure for this type of disease or a response to this type of cytokine storm. Um, so real quick, Jackie, I'm going to point this question to you. Could you first bring us in, in our audience in, into just the basic difference between uh, SARS-CoV-2 versus COVID-19. What is the virus? What is the symptoms? Mm, that's great. So yes, uh, SARS-CoV-2 is the actual virus that um, infects uh, humans. Um, it also has uh, infected animals, and uh, we know that. Um, it's been in animals for a while. Um, and uh, like um, very often in history, some of these viruses, they uh, transmit over to a human. And because humans have never seen these viruses before, we have a very um, explosive response to them. Our bodies have never seen them. And uh, we react uh, very, uh, if you want, like violently to this new uh, antigen or pathogen that uh, comes into our body. Um, and that brings us to COVID-19 because COVID-19 is a, is a whole... Uh, so all these symptoms that uh, SARS-CoV-2 creates in the body is now coined COVID-19. Um, so uh, in the beginning, you would have what we call like flu-like symptoms, uh, fever, malaise, nausea and vomiting, um, really mm. like really like you got hit with the flu really bad. Mm. But unfortunately, because this is brand new to our bodies, uh, our inflammation system or our innate immune system goes haywire and can really put out a lot of inflammatory mediators and they can become dysregulated. And that whole cascade of events is then called the cytokine storm, whereas all these inflammatory mediators are now attacking your lungs, your heart, your kidneys, um, your coagulation system. And that is where you turn into a severe COVID-19 situation. Um, so, so some people don't, don't go uh, into severe, but we don't know who will or who won't. So that's, that's quite a problem. And Jim, that's been Senjam's main focus. I mean, last time we spoke, it was around the opioid crisis and around withdrawal symptoms. And what I took from that conversation is it's really our body's response to these withdrawal symptoms and how you can reduce these symptoms with therapeutics and um, uh, pharmaceuticals like your own. Could you walk us through how you came 
to this solution for COVID-19 with respect to the prior work and vision of Senjam to reduce this cytokine storm for, for other uh, important topics like the opioid crisis and alcohol hangover? Yeah, so all of our work is based on on uh, on on pain and inflammation, uh, and 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 uh, reducing pain and inflammation, disrupting pain and inflammation, and uh, you know when Jackie you know first started thinking about these therapeutics and this these unmet needs, um, you know, the, and the and the work that she had done at Sloan Kettering, she always looked at how, that we're always treating pain versus preventing pain. And the an early uh, thesis was, you know, what can we do? You know, wh what is you know what is it that causes pain? And it's and uh, it's her conclusion that it was an inflammatory response. That an inflammatory response occurs, and then it's the that getting out of control results in in um, in the you know in the introduction of of, uh, of pain. So um, early on, at, as it relates to COVID. Uh, you know, we had done a lot of research around uh, other unmet, large unmet needs, and one of them was the upper respiratory virus, uh, the common, what's known as the common cold. And when COVID became available, or COVID came out, we retooled uh, two of our therapeutics that Jackie believed that would have an impact against COVID-19, and we sent them down to a biosafety level three lab in, in Australia, which is a lab that had SARS-CoV-2 to test against. And we tested these compounds against in vitro as, as cell lines against the virus. And, uh, and the results came back that we, we, uh, it were, an, we were an anti-inflammatory that had antiviral capabilities that reduced the viral load by greater than 90%. So mm -hmm. it was through that, it was through that, you know, our interest in disrupting pain, our portfolio of products, our interest in upper respiratory infections, that when when this came out, um, you know, it was, you know, Jackie thought that, you know, here's an opportunity, let's let's explore this. And Jackie, the three main metrics, you know, in the business, you're measuring your KPIs for COVID. The three main metrics have to do with like the spread, the severity of that, as well as the total number of cases. And so the spread is the R, var the R variable. And so this is if it's a 0.7 for every 10 people that are infected, seven more will be infected. Where measles is for every one person that is infected, 15 more people will get infected. So this R var variable, when you talk about the response and reducing these symptoms and the spread, the viral load, like Jim referred to, how can your therapeutics do that? Walk us through how it reduces those symptoms of COVID-19. Yeah, so the combination product that we um, are, we have an open uh, clinical trial that will begin in December 1st, um, and it will be a phase two trial in humans. And we are combining two agents together, and uh, maybe people in the audience are familiar with them because we've repurposed drugs. And one of them is indomethacin, which is very similar to perhaps your ibuprofen or your Aleve product that you could purchase over the counter. And the second one is an antihistamine that's called ketotifen. And ketotifen is an antihistamine, but it has some very special qualities to it. Um, now, interesting, like when, if you had the flu or you had the cold, you would say, oh, let me go to the pharmacy and I wanna relieve those symptoms you might even choose those products off of your shelf. An antihistamine could be your fexofenadine or your uh, uh, Benadryl products. Benadryl, right, okay. Right, and those would relieve your symptoms because uh, they actually decrease inflammation. So what we did is we took the most potent in those categories of a non anti-inflammatory and antihistamine, and we, we sought two of them, the indomethacin and the ketotifen, which are the most potent drugs in those categories, and we combined them together to get the most potent anti-inflammatory response hmm. with the least amount of side effects. Right now, the standard of care is you have to wait until you have a severe case of COVID before they're going to give you a steroid, which is dexamethasone, which dexamethasone has turned out to be probably the most effective agent in decreasing COVID symptoms. But because it affects, it, de it 
it is so immunosuppressive, it prevents your adaptive immune system from uh, creating antibodies. And we need our bodies to produce these antibodies. And it takes a little bit of time and the vaccine can jumpstart that. But you can't receive dexamethasone in the standard of care until you're severe. So our product being a potent anti-inflammatory that does not affect your ability to uh, generate antibodies can be given on day one to decrease those symptoms of COVID that patients have. Again, the pain, the malaise, the joint aches, the nausea, the vomiting. On day one, decrease those symptoms, but also prevent the progression of that huge inflammatory response so you don't progress to hospitalization, to ventilator, to supplemental oxygen needs. So that is why uh, we are pursuing this with, um, with like lightning speed <laughs> to try and bring it to the market. Well, it's lightning speed, but you're running into obstacles, whether it's funding, whether it's just a global acceptance, whether it's politics, whether it's just the mindset. Um, walk me, Jim, walk me through the pathway in order to get this drug approved by the FDA and accepted by a, a medical society. Yeah, so it will pick up, you know, we, we were just talking about this recently that you know, when we say lightning speed, we spent 18 months on this and we're mm -hmm. so excited that in three months from now we'll be in the clinic. And, uh, but when we got our results back from the biosafety level, uh, the lab in Australia, uh, which was a huge, a monumental effort to just make that happen. You know, we were able to quickly partner with uh, Duke, uh, Duke University in uh, Singapore. And uh, Dr. Ashley St. John, who's an immunologist, she was doing some research around dengue fever and Zika and, and using one of the compounds. Mm. And uh, there was a true connection between us and, and them. And we spent the latter part of last year working with, with Duke in Singapore to, to uh, advance um, our, our co-development relationship. And then in the, the beginning of this year, Ashley presented our findings to, uh, doc, to uh, the COVID task force at Duke in uh, Durham. And uh, they were very excited about what we were proposing because it was scientific based. And then that led to, to furthering the discussions to opening, ultimately opening up this phase two clinical trial. So our goal coming out of this now that we've, we're, we're locked in is to, um, after completing this trial, is, you know, based on the results, is, is we could possibly go for emergency use authorization uh, with the FDA or move into a phase three clinical, uh, clinical trial. But coupled with all of that, you know, mm -hmm. we're looking, we're, you know, we're, um, you know, we're, we're looking at the supply chain of, of uh, the therapeutic as well, because we know, we, we, we truly believe that this is gonna work. And, uh, and in support of our mission of improving societal well-being by creating therapeutics that are safe, efficacious, and accessible to all, you know, we wanna start working with a localized strategy around the world with manufacturers, which we've already started doing, so that we can avoid some of the politics and we can avoid some of the other challenges that we may face upon uh, a successful completion of, of this trial. You know, what we're hoping is that, that we'll have, you know, six or eight or 10 partnerships around the world, manufacturing partnerships, where, where they've paralleled us. And then upon our, you know, successfully completing our trial and looking at where, what we're going to do next, they could be ready for manufacturing. And mm -hmm. we talk about on the local level, what we've seen over the last year is when politics have come in, some countries have shut down shipping product out and other countries have stopped shipping product in. And, and uh, we're trying to get ahead of that, uh, given that only a million, billion people have been vaccinated at 8 billion in the world. And the access to vaccinations and the access to the standard of care is really, really high. Um, you know, we're trying to avoid all of that by looking at the entire supply chain of what we're doing as well as advancing the therapeutic. Now, there are other repurposed drugs out there that are very similar to this that have been, whether they're Nobel Prize winning therapeutics or they've been in uh, over-the-counter drugs for 20 plus years that have been now repurposed, uh, profit-centered or not, there are similar you know, therapeutics out there that can do similar type um, uh, 
uh, treatments, I guess, provide similar types of treatments. However, what they are running into, Jim, is what you're referring to is a politicization. Do you think you could overcome something like that with the backs of um, this call to get everyone vaccine? As, as a lot of people see it as a, um, as a, a, I guess, a prohibitor to get people vaccine, giving someone an outlet to take something else versus getting the vaccine. Yeah, I, you know, this is, um, you know, that we're going to reach a point where either there's not access to, to vaccines in certain areas because of, you know, being cost prohibitive or, or the, or just handling the, you know, what's required to, to ship, to store, to, to, to uh, draw and to, to administer a vaccine is, is, uh, is a logistics uh, challenge in itself. And if anything breaks up along the line, if you can't store at the proper temperature, if you if you don't use the product in, a, in the shortest in the period of time that's it has a refrigerated a refrigeration life, um, you know it's a, it's a challenge in itself, and that's why we're looking as we're looking at a therapeutic that that doesn't have uh, a lot of those restrictions around it. Mm-hmm. Um, we're not looking at we're not looking at at ourselves as a replacement of the vaccines. We're we're, we're truly believers in the vaccine. And, and especially now that we're hearing more about breakthrough cases of people being vaccinated who, who are getting, and it's moving out of COVID, it's moving more to coronaviruses as we, as we get the, the, the new variants are coming. We've been talking a lot about Delta, but there'll be more after Delta. So it's more, it's more of a broad um, you know, coronavirus topic. So we, we're, we're, the way that we're trying to deal with it is is uh is look holistically um around the world of and and we're partnering with some of the best people in the world around this so that we could not not get pushed up against um you know the u.s trying to to push a product into Mm. some other country we'd rather be making it in that country Mm. and and supporting the needs of that country Mm. um with our efforts yeah i think that just to just to add to what jim said is that you know when we do look back on this event called COVID-19, which might take many years, um, we are going to realize that we have to, you know, adapt ourselves around this virus. We're going to be living with it um, for, you know, it's going to be the new thing. And uh, so there's going to be a, a large number of therapeutics available uh, f- that will become the standard of care for how this is treated. Mm. So I think that um, it will always be here, but we want to adapt ourselves so that it doesn't uh, disrupt our lives. Um, similar to, for example, um, getting a cold. Uh, well, I know I have the cold and sometimes it's just hard to avoid, um, but I don't want to be laid up in bed for three days feeling awful. I want to be able to do all the things I do. And I think that mm that we're gonna have a number of therapeutics available to us, vaccines included, that can help get us back out there and um, being productive and, and doing the things we like to do, just living. Definitely, definitely. And, and also what I've, I think most people have learned is like every body has a different immune system and a different reaction for this thing. How many test trials do you have to go through in order to get at least uh, some type of approval or affirmation from the scientific community that this is a trusted medicine that if taking the vaccine or if not taking the vaccine, if you have symptoms at all, can reduce your your uh, inflammation in the cytokine storm. How, how many, case, uh, I guess, cases or trials would you have to go through in order to get this approved? Right. Well, um, nobody knows the answer to that right now. Nope. No <laughs> unfortunately, um, we, because we're in a pandemic situation, the uh, the numbers of people that uh, are getting um, evaluated with new therapeutics is much lower than what should be our standard. And we know that in the medical profession, we know that we, um, in order to see a a uh, percentage reduction in in symptoms or people going to the hospital, you do need a large number of people, but we don't have, unfortunately, we don't have that time and capacity to do this. So unfortunately, in order to bring a life-saving therapy to decrease suffering to the market, 
um, all governments, all agencies are requiring lower and lower number of patients. And so when um, these then pass emergency use authorization and a larger number of patients are, being, are receiving them, we can gather more and more data on it. So I think what will happen with the whole standard of care is you're going to see products that may make it past emergency use authorization today that might get pulled later and re-examined later. But because it's all we have, that's what we're going with now. So right. I think there's going to be a lot of, you know, starts and finishes and moving forward um, with this. So I think it's going to be a long process. One thing I want to add to that is because we're in the, we talked about repurposing, uh, you know, therapeutics because we are using the 505B2 pathway. And one of the advantages that we have from an acceleration perspective is that we can re we can reuse the safety data on the drug. So, right. so this is not like we're starting out. This is not this is new molecular entity. It's not a new chemical entity, and uh, and traditionally under the five hundred five B two pathway, um, you know we could bring you know in in a traditional manner. It's usually three little over three years to bring a new therapeutic to market. Um, that that would include the tr all the traditional route of phase one, phase two, phase three, and all the other uh, items that you have to do to accommodate that. So we, we feel as though we're at a tremendous advantage because mm -hmm. of the safety profiles of these two drugs that we're bringing together. And what is the current funding that's out there to support endeavors like yours? And what are you asking for? Yeah, so the current funding, uh, from a longer term perspective, there's grants and there's there's, there's, there are, uh, uh, you know, government uh, monies that are available. We've been very fortunate uh, with a group of angel investors that we have that have gotten us to where we are today. And now we're looking at making the transition from angel investors to institutional investors. And so we are in discussion with, with uh, several companies that are interested, uh, VCs that are interested in what we're doing. Um, but, you know, given given the the frothiness of the financial markets you know we're not looking for an exorbitant amount of money and mm -hmm. and we're being viewed um that you know the amount of money that we're looking for is is small in the scheme of things for a venture capital firm or, or a financial firm mm -hmm. it's as easy to manage uh five million it, five it's it's as easy to manage 500 million dollars as it is to manage five million dollars and uh so you know, oftentimes a lot of discussions that we have are firms that are looking for 25, 50, 100, 200, 300 million dollar investments into into companies like ours. And uh, and, you know, that's not what we're looking for. And and a lot of that is due to the frothiness of the market and so much capital being available. So so we're continuing to, uh, you know, look at making this transition uh, from our 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 grateful angels, so to speak to the more uh, institutional uh, space. And it is, it has been challenging. And, and I want to go back to Jackie. Jackie, I just want to bring our audience in. Could you quickly explain your background uh, in, in medicine? And then also let me, you know, fill me in. What are nurses and uh, care, you know, healthcare providers currently using to treat people with these symptoms? Yeah. Yes. So, um, so my background is a is a pharmacist, and I've always enjoyed, um, particularly the hospital pharmacist setting. I found that very um, exciting, and um, and uh, I also did research at uh, Memorial Sloan Kettering in pain management, and I always had a vision of a pharmacist uh, being more than I guess your community pharmacist. Um, and what I mean by that is that it's. Um, you know, if you're um, providing information and education to one person at a time, it's it's uh, difficult to affect change. But I thought the way to educate a large mass of people is by bringing a product to the market. And by bringing a product to the market, when somebody sees it, they begin to understand, oh, that's what I could use it for. And why does this work this way? And you're educating them about their bodies, really. And in the space of inflammation, and we really don't, you know, as more and more diseases are finding their beginning point at an inflammatory marker of, you know, that's why perhaps we see cardiac disease and diabetes and metabolic diseases, and they all are beginning with this inflammatory 
beginning. And we really don't have a large number of products available to consumers and even by prescription to have an oral, safe, inexpensive product to quell inflammation. And so it really became a real passion of mine to um, really to, to bring that educational component, not only to the consumer, but to physicians. And before the show, Jim, you sent me a kind of a matrix and a comparison of how much these remedies cost versus what uh, your therapeutic uh, would cost. And obviously it's in the mission. You want to make sure it's efficacious for all, affordable for all. Uh, the Biden administration trying to lower the prices of um, uh, pharmaceuticals uh, today, introducing a house bill. Why make it so affordable? And, and what's your viewpoint on um, making affordable medicine for all as a company? Great question. Um, you know, accessibility. I mean, you know, part of our mission is, you know, accessible by all is so critical for us. And, uh, you know, if, you know, we have the good fortune of, of um, getting the benefit of these small molecules that have cost billions of dollars to create and, you know, 10 to 15 years to create, and they've come off a patent and just, be, you know, when a small molecule is created, it's got to be created for a specific indication, but it has other uh, positive benefits. And Jackie was able to identify those other positive benefits. And, uh, and we, we've been fortunate because we've been able to file intellectual property, which gives us the ability to continue to develop in a, in a safe environment. Um, but you know, when you look at the standard of care as, as it relates to COVID, uh, and, and we hear, you know, it, it, you don't hear all of the stories of what these, um, what, what the standard of cost is, you know, whether, uh, you know, you know, whether people are getting uh, monoclonal antibody or dexamethasone. Um, and once you enter the hospital, I mean, once those emergency doors open up, you know, it's a $10,000 bill. Mm -hmm. And, you know, if you move to intensive care, you know, it's $50,000. And, you know, you, you start adding this up and the statistics that have just come out with the, the growth of the number of cases, both in the U.S. and the world, and the and the percentage growth of death in the U.S. and the world, you could just you could back test that to see how much how much care went into in, into those people who have been diagnosed as a case and unfortunately who have died, and so we're trying to go you know upstream, we're trying to go upstream and trying to prevent you know the progression from you know mild to moderate to to uh admission to a hospital and we really we truly believe to you know get to the the specifics of your question we truly believe that if we can have an impact early on we can reduce the entire progression and then that will bring um you know such great relief to the world it, it, it's interesting to think about because when this first happened, I remember there was a large com uh, conversation around, we need immediately need a vaccine. We just in immediately need one. And as we know, you know, there's no silver bullet for anything. And you do like, when you talk about the spectrum of care, could you dive into that a little bit? What is the spectrum of care? Well, on our last podcast, we talked about the opioid crisis, inpatient, outpatient, withdrawal symptoms, uh, how you can treat a patient at different levels uh, throughout their addiction process. Could you bring us up to speed on what the current spectrum of care is for COVID and just be very clear on where you see this uh, therapeutic taking place? I know we've already talked about And, and let, let me help set this up a little yeah. for Jackie. Um, Please. Oh, hopefully it's, it's perceived as a setup. Yeah. But you know, one of the things, because we're asked, we're asked this question a lot, and mm. we're and we're also being told as we're talking to prospective investors that the space is very crowded. A lot of people are coming into this space. And but as I'm hearing all of this, you know, I look back over the last year and this is part of the setup. Uh, the standard of care is exactly the same mm -hmm. and it hasn't changed. So hasn't changed. I, I keep looking yeah. out the door and saying, OK, so all these new products are coming. All this news. Where is it? Where is it? Mm -hmm. I mean, I've, I, you know, throughout in my previous career, you know, fail, fail fast, like bring something forward, fail fast. And like, we should be trying everything. And, and so, you know, that's, that's my setup is that I've looked over the last, 
year plus as we've been following this, waiting for waiting for new things to come in, novel. And uh, there's a lot of talk about antivirals, and and we're an anti-inflammatory that has antiviral capability. So you hear people talking about antivirals, and you hear people talking about uh, other therapeutics that Jackie will probably bring up. That that they're almost in every conversation that comes up, like you know, in in vermectin or or hydroxychloroquine, and you know, we're evidence based. If something works, and you can bring the evidence, like we want to get behind it. But but it's not. It's, it's not right to bring something to consumers or to, mm -hmm. to, to provide a projection that something works when it, when it hasn't been tested that it works. Mm -hmm. And we spend billions of dollars around these things. Mm -hmm. So that's my setup. <laughs> okay. Well, Standard of care. Well, well, yeah. yeah, continue. Sorry. So, so, so um, currently the standard of care is um, that you, you get diagnosed with COVID and you quarantine and you stay at home and, you know, you don't do anything really. I mean, people have fevers, they have coughs, they are not feeling well, and maybe they go to the pharmacy, hopefully somebody goes for them, and they try and find something on the over-the-counter shelf that nobody has recommended yet, right? And then they pray that they don't get worse, and but unfortunately, if they do, and they go back to the emergency room, and you're assessed based on your the, your need of supplemental oxygen. If you do need oxygen, they'll also start you on remdesivir, and they'll also start you on dexamethasone. Now, if you're in a high uh, risk category and you let your physician know that you do you just tested positive for COVID, they might recommend that you go to the emergency room and get a monoclonal antibody infusion. Um, so. A way of looking at COVID from my standpoint is let's look at it from the immune system, sure. all right? So you have, you're struck with this new antigen. It's this new thing that just happened to your body. You've never seen it before and your body is going to overreact. So you could, de and, and what's going to happen in your body is your, your body's going to see this new antigen and it's going to eventually create antibodies mm -hmm. but it's going to take 10 to 14 days for that to happen so if you get a vaccine then you're priming your body to recognize that antigen so that if you do get covid your body should be able to jump start those antibodies mm -hmm. so right, right. that's probably why we're seeing less patients that are vaccinated end up into severe COVID situations in the hospitals. Um, but let's, again, we'll go back to the immune system. So when you first get COVID, your body is having a response to it and it's causing all this inflammation, but we're not doing anything about it. And we love our product because on day one, you could start taking it to reduce that inflammation. Mm -hmm. And then that inflammation hopefully won't become dysregulated and go into that cytokine storm because you've kept it, quelling it to a lower amount. Mm. Where the antivirals come in is that when we have antivirals, for example, the flu, we have Tamiflu, the evidence shows that even that antiviral only reduces your uh, symptoms by like a half a day of the entire flu period. And what it's doing is even though it reduces all that viral load, it still doesn't do anything about the inflammation. So even though reducing the viral load gives your body, um, let's say, some extra breathing room, it's not taking care of what the true problem is, which is the inflammation that's going on. So anything that can boost your immune system to, to you know, put it into high gear, would be a benefit and anything that can reduce all the inflammation that you don't want would be a benefit. So instead of looking at it as like, it's, got, it's a virus and I've got to kill the virus, we have to really look at how do we get rid of all these symptoms that are causing the damage. It makes sense. And it would make sense why you would reach out to someone who's been dealing with Bengay fever or other types of viruses that could cause these nasty diseases what's been their research in, in Britain? Why go to an expert like this who has background and has dedicated their career to finding remedies to reduce inflammation? 
Yeah. So um, Dr. Ashley St. John has a wonderful career, um, over 20 years of studying. Um, well, she's an immunologist. And so you're like, well, why did she study viruses? Well, that's because all viruses cause this immune response mm -hmm. and some worse than others. And a dengue fever is such such a, uh, a, a virus that is very, um, oh, it causes lots of suffering causes lots of suffering. And so um, trying to find any therapeutic that could help uh, people with dengue fever, it would be a huge, um, a huge gift. And um, so she's been studying it for 20 years. And in animals, she constantly uses this drug that we have in our product, this keto -tifen. And over and over again, no matter what animal model, it is showing that it reduces all the cytokine storm and reduces all this inflammation and where untreated animals die these animals have a hundred percent survival so she even tried it in non-human uh, primates and again repeats this that she can save all these animals from uh, the inflammatory response of dengue fever so they did a human trial in singapore and uh, compared it to placebo. And at times the study had to be stopped because people were progressing and having side effects. So they, un, uh, they broke the blinding only to find out that it was all the placebo that mm. was causing all this progression of disease and, and uh, adverse effects. And the people who were on ketotifen were doing just fine. Um, so we don't have the full results yet, but, uh, you know, this is, this is fabulous that, that keto Tifen had that ability. And, um, so when, you know, we saw our results that it also had antiviral capability, you know, she was our first phone call. <laughs> no, definitely, definitely. And, and it just makes you wonder, you know, it's like, I, someone who has experienced COVID, you know, I think about my long term effects, I'm a very healthy human being, I think also another thing that isn't talked about enough is just, hey, be prepared for this, get your body healthy, eat, you know, healthy, take supplements, you know, do the things to get your body healthy, we have a overweight crisis in this country. And in order, like, at least the stats are showing people who are you know, unfortunately passing away from this are elderly populations or overweight populations. So do what you can in advance mm -hmm. to make sure it's a preventative. Now yours is after you've received these symptoms. And the thing that scares me the most is when something like this happens, when I got it very early on before there was a vaccine, um, I didn't really know what to do other than to stay inside. Like you mentioned, that was the, the solution. And, and so I stayed inside for many weeks. I, I worked every day and I don't want to make light of it. It didn't affect me as much as it affected everybody. And it is a serious disease. But when you have doctors who are saying things like hydrochloroquine or ivermectin, like Mexico did, and, and ivermectin is a Nobel Peace Prize winning therapeutic. Um, and it used to treat river blindness in, in these communities. Mm -hmm. Like, you know, it's, it's, it's a credible, uh, thing now we have nurses and people that aren't prescribing it uh, based on what big pharma or uh, their their uh, corporations are telling them not to so it's scary for me as an individual when i now think about my long-term health the the cognitive support that covid may have had on me shortening my lifespan um having problems breathing with my lungs fortunately i exercise every day but still it was difficult to exercise when I had COVID and I severely noticed it and it was very mm -hmm. scary and took, you know, uh, three, four weeks to, to kind of take, get rid of it. Um, Jim, what are your thoughts on kind of rolling this out? Uh, if you were to roll it out, if you were at that point to the public, how would you position this product? Yeah, well, that's why, um, you know, our, our business model is to de-risk on the clinical and regulatory side. So, so we want to do early, all the preliminary early work, which we've done. And then, you know, upon clearing the, the uh, you know, the, the clinical hurdle of acceptance, moving more to the regulatory side of things. But now, and we have really hit the ground running with this, as I, I mentioned a little earlier, um, it, you know, it's all about partnerships. It's, uh, you know, we, we aren't going to build a sales force. We're not going to build a factory. We're not going to you know, just as we've repurposed small molecules, we're going to repurpose, 
you know, manufacturing capacity, supply chain capacity. We're going to repurpose all of that. Um, and we have to be thinking big. I mean, if, mm. if, uh, if we're successful and, and uh, you know, in a year, 15 months from now, we need 100 billion pills. Um, mm. You know, we've got to be thinking of how, how can we have the manufacturing partners and the capacity all the way from the, from, uh, the active pharmaceutical ingredients to, to, to getting it to, those, to the manufacturers and then them being able to get it out to points of distribution. I mean, we, we all, what, what, we, what we certainly wouldn't want to have happen upon being successful as we we're, we're still scratch our heads when we went to the supermarkets and all the toilet paper was gone and all, all the paper towels were gone and other things were gone. And like, we wonder like, why were those things you know, chosen mm-hmm. and, and all, all uh, the shelves were empty to them? You know, we have an opportunity here to be proactive and and that's what that's that's what we're going to do to to get ahead of this is to make sure that we we early on make the soft relationships you know be 100 percent transparent and visible with the people that we're working with you know and making sure that we just communicate so then we when we're ready we're ready and mm-hmm. it's not that something happens and then we say oh now we got to start and we got to find manufacturers we got to do all of that because that'll take a year and a half right Definitely. And, and, you know, because this is a sensitive topic, we'll make sure to kind of go through and fact check kind of everything I'm saying. One of the things I already said is Nobel Peace Prize, folks. It's not Nobel Peace Prize. The Nobel Prize is different, obviously. Um, but I just want to make sure, you know, I'm stumbling over my words. We've, it's a very difficult subject when you're trying to think on, on the spot here. Um, so going forward from a, from a business perspective now and a leadership perspective now, how are you rallying your organization how are you reaching out and communicating with partners what is your approach to take this to light speed and get this into the hands of people who need it the most well the biggest support that we've gotten you know as being an active member in ypo young president's organization for 25 years uh throughout my previous career around supply chain uh early on in this we we leveraged a lot of the relationships with YPO to help us get access to to uh, to the therapeutics to get to to accelerate to get through customs to, to move things and then you know along the way you know YPO members have been incredible uh, and then most recently we've really whipped that up again um, with the access to the YPO network and the resources that they have and breadth and reach into into every country around the world. So, so that, that's a, that's a big part of, of, uh, of, of the network that we're, 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 we're looking at. Um, and, and, uh, and then in addition to that, we're using, you know, traditional approaches of identifying, um, you know, companies that are manufacturing, uh, these, um, active pharmaceutical ingredients independently, some that are, that are manufacturing them together, and uh, and and looking to start early relationship with, with them, uh, again, as, as as silly as it sounds, uh, but it's so important for us to be looking ahead at whatever volumes we may need of this. You know, we don't want to get ourselves into a situation where the active pharmaceutical in- ingredient, you know, takes six months to create, and we only have two months on hand, and we need a twelve month supply. And mm-hmm. like they're they're the early stage things that we have to be thinking about now. Uh, to be proactive and you know we may be wrong you know that we may we may only advance science with our with our with our therapy right, right. Um, but if we're right we want to we want to make sure that we have everything uh, in order and if we're wrong and we advance our therapeutics we want to make sure that the people who are going to be you know taking what we're doing to the next level to create something that we've got uh, you know, we've created the most valuable data that's that's possible for for people to use for scientific research yeah. it's, well, like to, it's well oh yeah i'd like to just add that you know um you know you could have your your business partnerships but um you know there's a lot of uh, a gratitude i feel for um those individuals in the medical sciences who um you know take the time to to see what we're doing and to um really uh 
know inside what they could do to um, to expand our reach um, from whether it's the hospitals down in Duke that um, have given us this opportunity. And also, um, you know, we're doing our study in Nepal on, uh, because there's a lack of vaccinations and monoclonal antibodies there. Um, so we need uh, non-treated patients available to us. And, you know, just to be grateful that there's going to be people who are going to opt in to, uh, to take a chance, you know, on an experimental drug in order to end suffering around the world. I mean, you know, I think of those are, as our, those are our heroes. Absolutely. Well, Jim, Jackie, it's been a pleasure speaking with you all, as always. I wish you the best of luck in your endeavors uh, going forward. I hope to do a little follow-up conversation in a few months, see where this is going, track the progress of Sengen Pharmaceuticals. Uh, but we're short on time here today. I apologize for that. We do have a double header today, so we have another interview. Real quick, where can people find more information about Sengen Pharmaceuticals and how can they help? Yeah, you could start with, uh, you can look at our website at uh, Sen hyphen jam, J-A-M, uh, dot com. So send-jam.com. That's our website. Uh, from there, you can uh, you can look at, you can ask, you know, to be added to our stakeholders list where we, we publish uh, at least one uh, activity a month of things that are going on to advance our technology. Um, or you can reach out to me directly at J-I-V, as in Victor, E-R-S-E-N, at send-jam.com and uh obviously we love what we're doing where we feel as though we have an opportunity to impact a lot of people and uh that supports our corporate mission as well as our our, per our personal mission for improving uh, societal well-being and and to both of you i know how hard you all have been working i know uh how hard it, it is to make that pivot as well from a year ago and just the leadership you've shown has been incredible to you jackie iverson what is your definition of a real leader mm. you asked me this a year ago and it hasn't changed which i think is a good a good a good part of a, a leader but i think i think it definitely has to do with passion i mean if you if you you know eat and live and drink it and you're so passionate about it it just really uh shows and and um you know, being um, empathetic as a leader, I think, is is uh, is the other characteristic. And I think if you just take the had those two characteristics, you could do it. For Jim and Jackie Iverson, I'm Kevin Edwards asking you to go out there, live your passion, and always, folks, keep it real. Thank you, Jim and Jackie. Thank, Thank you, Kevin. you, Kevin.